many of the uh, contributors to this project are former members. Uh, I just mentioned a few, Michael Atia, Simon Donaldson, Peter Lex, Murray Gelman, David Mumford, Stefan Smil, uh, members and, and even former faculty, but we're very happy to have two of our faculty here, which um, as they are in a uh, dual perspective, uh, because you will, uh, you're author, artist of the equations, but you're also uh, very uh, valued members of our community. And uh, so you're in a unique position to explain more um, what you uh, what you have contributed. So uh, Enrico, Enrico Bombieri, of course, all known to you, uh, fields medalist working in number theory, uh, professor in the School of Mathematics since 1977, and uh, Freeman Dyson, uh, even longer aff affiliated, and I won't even dare to summarize your association <laughs> with the Institute. Um, and, uh, but I think for both of you, uh, I can just say that uh, equations have been very important in your life. So uh, uh, if, if there's any meaning to it, I think we can hardly think of two people who, uh, who are more in a better position to speak on that particular topic. And um, so we'll have a discussion among ourselves for some moments, and then I would like to engage you. Uh, I would say you, know, you can all can think about your favorite equation in the meantime. Um, but perhaps starting with you, uh, Dan, can you just uh, bring us a little bit up to speed why this particular project and what in some sense is for you the motivation to do this and what would you like to convey with this project? Um, everybody hear me? Am I on? Um, so uh, as I indicated in the int little introduction I wrote, I, mean, it's, I, I met a guy on a plane. That, that's how it... That's how it started. Uh, I was flying back from Portland, Oregon, back to work, and um, I sat down next to this guy, and after we had both exhausted the crossword puzzles that we were working on, we started to talk, and I asked him what he did, and he said he was a print publisher. Uh, I actually didn't know what a print publisher was. Uh, I know what prints are, um, but I didn't know what a print publisher was. Um, and he asked me what I did, and I said I was a mathematician. And he said, well, that's interesting, and then we, Talk usually really. stops the discussion. Well, at a point. it usually does, and 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 that's part of the interesting thing. So this guy. What's your intention to? Well, you know, I, I like to. I don't know. It's a long flight. I'm happy for the conversation. So, uh, um, but uh, we got to talking a bit, and I asked him. I, I like art, uh, which always sounds kind of corny, but it's true. Um, and I asked him, you know, who did he publish? And he said, Well, I, I, I was Ansel Adams' first publisher, and I published, was the first publisher for most of the great minimalists. And I said, like Saul Lewitt, and as Bob Feldman tells a story, he thought and he said, oh, this guy knows something. Um, so, uh, so we got to talking and then he told me, which is why the conversation didn't end, he said, you know, I always had this idea in mind. I, for, for I think 30 or 40 years, I've wanted to publish a portfolio of the equations of the great Nobel, Pri this is this is a quote: Nobel Prize-winning mathematicians, <laughs> and so every mathematician in here laughed, and so I, and, and 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 so I and so I laughed, and I said, "Well, Bob, you're going to have trouble because mathematicians don't generally win the Nobel Prize. Um, it's a very small set, uh, but if you will expand it to Fields medals and such, I think you have a project." And uh, and and he said he tried to do it some 35 or 40 years ago, and uh, he was working with. Um, so he tried to work with someone else. It just didn't happen. And I said, well, I'll do that. And, um, and that was sort of how this, that's how this was born. Uh, Bob Feldman had had this idea in his head for 40 years. And as I said, he's, um, he's, he's a very, Solowitz's first publisher. I mean, he's all, if you name an, a minimalist, he's, he's done that person. Um, so uh, that's, how it, that's how it started. I then made my way contacting mathematicians, physicists, computer scientists, some of whom I knew a little bit, such as Freeman and Enrico and others who I didn't know at all. Um, and we were able to build out a set of 10. Um, and I, to get back, I think, to your, to, to, to your uh, question, um, I, I've, I've often had to explain to people or try to explain to people, well, what do mathematicians mean when they say something's beautiful? I mean, the person on the street just doesn't get it. Um, and I, I've spent a good part of my professional life trying to explain that in different venues, whether it's in a documentary or in a, uh, 
in writing. And um, this is, in some sense, a sort of perfect uh, expression of that. Uh, moving on to Freeman, so, uh, we, at some point we will ask you some questions about your particular, the formula that you picked. But um, can you just say, you know, this, this notion of the beauty of equations, formulas, what, if you, well, how would you explain this? The strange thing to me is that this is equations, whereas I would always imagine geometry to be the most beautiful part of mathematics and the part that has been much more closer to art all through history. And in fact, my enormous piece of luck, I was a high school kid in England, and I actually, the school was very, very generous. They actually hired a private tutor for me, who was a, 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 some sort of a lecturer at, at Southampton University, who had the job of coming up and earning a few extra shillings every week. He came once a week to, to, to give me private lessons, and he is a geometer called Daniel Pedo, who had actually been a member of the Institute for Advanced Study. So I was introduced to the Institute very early, and, <laughs> and he was in love with geometry. He was a, a student also of Severi in Italy, and he had a profound knowledge of thing called Sangaku, which some of you may know about. This is a, a genre of halfway between art and science, which was practiced in Japan during the centuries when Japan was isolated from the West. And it was a marvelous way of doing in mathematics, which the Japanese devised, that uh, it was very widespread, not just in the cities, but even among the, the rural, rural population in villages, people were doing sangaku, which meant they had g real problems in geometry, which then were published by putting a tablet in the temple. You drew, and, and it was, of course, a work of art at the same time. So they drew these marvelous pictures, which were then were hung up in the temple, and then their rivals then would pu put up solutions to the problems in the same temples, and a lot of them still survive. This was, it was an art form that flourished during the 17th and 18th centuries and was still alive during the 19th. And then, of course, after Japan modern, modernized, they learned Western-style mathematics, and so this became uh, uh, unfashionable. But still, a lot of these tablets exist and are still to be found in the temples and elsewhere. And my teacher, Daniel Pedo, went to Japan and actually studied the Sangaku and wrote a book on the subject. So that was my introduction to art combined with mathematics. And so the idea of writing equations as works of art is something quite foreign to me, and I found it very interesting. It, I still I think that geometrical pictures are actually, to my mind, still more beautiful. That's that's a very interesting point that you uh, didn't. Uh, so when you approached uh, mathematicians, did you allow for the possibility that somebody would hand in a diagram or a sketch or a geometrical figure? Uh, well, you see, so Donaldson has a little, yes. um, you know, current loop there. Uh, so I, I, there were no, I mean, no directives were given. I just your most beautiful mathematic, your most beautiful mathematical expression. Yes. And you know you can't uh, you can't tell the artist what to do. Uh, <laughs> the artist will do uh, whatever they do. Um, and uh, so I, I mean, some people could have done that, but when when we said expression, almost everybody gave some expressions or or or, or only um, expressions. Mm -hmm. Enrico, you you sit here uh, in another capacity that I have to uh, mention here because. Uh, you also very, very generously donated this set of prints to the Institute, so uh, I want to thank you for that. Um, and I think you also, I want to briefly ask about that, uh, you told me already that uh, you uh, worked uh, very hard on your particular print. Um, and I want to ask you, because uh, perhaps not everybody knows, you're also a wonderful artist. 
Uh, so you you can look at this project and your own contribution from various perspectives. So can you say something about uh, not just the mathematical connotation, the kind of the intellectual strength of the equation, but just the physical appearance and what that means for you? Uh, <coughs> okay. Uh, when when I started uh, at my first encounter with real mathematics was with Euler's formula e to the pi i equals minus one. For me, it was mind-boggling, and I think it still is the most beautiful formula in mathematics. Probably for many students, I think that would be the one that in, they would in pick, fact, right? In when, fact, when Dan asked me to contribute, he said, well, can I use that formula? And said, well, no, it should be something personal. <laughs> <laughs> Euler could have submitted that, I think. So, <laughs> and actually, today, thinking about that, uh, uh, we, we, if we go back to antiquity, uh, Archimedes, the tomb of Archimedes was honored by his, what Archimedes considers his most famous, most beautiful discovery, that the area of a sphere is the same as the area of the cylinder around the sphere. And so on his tomb was engraved the figure of a sphere inside the cylinder. And that was uh, how Cicero discovered the lost tomb of Archimedes when he was quester of, um, in Sicily. So uh, the beauty in mathematics has a long, long history. And that, that's a very precise example. So um, for me... Just before you go to that, yeah. but I think for those in the audience who are not mathematicians, etc., you know, I think it's an incredibly difficult question to answer, but as you say, beauty was a role, played a very important role over many, many centuries. Would you even dare to b begin a definition of what that beauty en entices? Well, beauty has many facets, not, not just one. Uh, for example, it could be uh, power and it could be uh, elegance, simplicity. And uh, simplicity has power, too. And uh, it also is the meaning it, in itself. What, what is, uh, so in mathematics, beauty is uh, simply one, one of the things, why you do this? And the reason is, be, one, because you want to know, but uh, mathematics is not solving puzzles. It is something. Uh, which are much more content. And uh, so that's the reason there are mathematical theories. Uh, people write really uh, monographs on uh, very specific uh, uh, limited subjects uh, and trying to explore. And, and so uh, the totality of the knowledge is an incredible, beautiful construction. Is it for you a guiding principle in your own mathematics? Uh, yes, um, and the formula uh, which I used is uh, an example. Um, maybe I should tell a little story about that. You can. You, do you want me to show the formula or, or later perhaps? Well, okay. maybe you can show it uh, just for the visual appearance. Uh, yes. Uh, the important thing to understand is on the left is a set of equations, uh, some information. The double arrow is, uh, means implies. So statement A, statement B, and statement C imply together, imply the equation below, and uh, that implies that the square of sigma is 3. Well, uh, the problem is about understanding symmetry. And uh, the simplest symmetries are reflections. And I think uh, when you look in a mirror, you have a symmetry in which you interchange uh, right and, and left, for example. That's uh, very simple. There are rotational symmetries, uh, mirror symmetries, and uh, 
when you start combining them, you, you get an incredible variation. And mathematicians have worked uh, now for over a century to understand uh, all, all possible symmetries, which, in a sense, uh, once you repeat them, they, they don't, uh, you don't get new, new, new symmetries. If you look in a mirror twice, then you exchange right and left, and left and right, and you don't come back where, where you were. So that will be the simplest symmetry, two, two elements. And uh, so understanding finite symmetry is a basic question in mathematics. It appears a lot in crystallography, in uh, so understanding, uh, in fact, minerals and properties of minerals and physics uh, of... Uh, uh, um, certain aspects of physics, and um, uh, a lot of modern mathematics is concentrated around, in fact, what are called groups. And uh, well, I was in Paris in uh, in '73, and uh, uh, John Thompson, uh, very well-known, famous group theorist, uh, was giving a course at Collège de France. I gave another course on number theory. And uh, we were, after our lectures, we'll go for lunch and, of course, talk shop. And so we talk, we will talk about mathematics. He, will, he wanted to know the, ma the mathematics I was doing and I will wanted to know what John was doing. And uh, uh, then at the end, John said, well, there is a problem that we don't know how to finish. We have worked for years and years, and I think I've extracted everything we can get from the group theory, and I simply, it seems impossible to finish. And they said, you know geometry, and maybe with geometry or other methods of mathematics, it can be done. Why don't you try? So he wrote the equations you see at the left on a napkin, and the task was to produce that consequence at the end. And uh, I worked for four months on that with no results whatsoever, piles and piles of calculations, and every time we'll try to shrink the, the, what you see at the left, will double in size eventually, <laughs> uh, simply. And I knew uh, and that, uh, in fact, uh, at the end, some equation had to come out. But why that particular equation? And so after a while, I gave up. You then gave I, up, so do you? Yes. Then I came to the Institute. <laughs> <laughs> the plot thickens. <laughs> the plot thickens, and in 78, uh, there was a special program on uh, finite groups, the classification of finite simple groups. And Danny Gorenstein was the director of the group of the research uh, on uh, the special program. And then a very, very easygoing person. And so we always at lunch, we'll talk together. He started explaining me <coughs> group theory. And then ended up in my office every week, spending two hours teaching me uh, finite simple groups, and then I asked whether that problem, the problem of regroups, had been solved. I said, no, it's not been solved, we have given, given up. Given up? The whole field had given up? <laughs> <laughs> Simply, they have exhausted all the resources of group theory. So I said, well, I want to give a last try. So I went to the library, got the formulas back, and this time I had been working on something else, uh, the, some other problem, 
And the other problem that required the procedure of very old-fashioned algebra called elimination theory. How to, we have an equation, many, many things to eliminate most things. And uh, so I had some experience with determinants and essentially as a kind of preliminary idea how to do, uh, to do this. So I wrote to John, and I have this, this idea and so on. I have to compute this 12 by 12 determinant, something incredible. <laughs> and uh, I mean, if you try to expand, you get uh, zillions of terms. And uh, um, maybe do you think is some possible uh, approach? So I received a letter back, very, very nice. It said, well, with a method similar to yours, I got to 16 by 16 determinants. So your determinant is a bit smaller, but I still think it's too big. So I felt very stupid. Yes. So cutting it to the chase a bit, yeah. uh, because the answer, the answer is incredibly simple, right? That's in some sense the... Everybody yes, can see yeah, that the right-hand side of the equation that, that, is very exactly. simple. Exactly. But then how to get this simple answer? It became clear that he tried to do just the old-fashioned algebra. The formulas explode, really. And they get a number of terms, uh, which is uh, 10 to the 50 or so. So no comp no, all the computers in the universe could not do it. So uh, simply too big. So I thought, if there's any way of doing that, I should do it without ever writing down a formula. In your mind? I cannot do it in my mind, so not on paper, not in my mind. Yes. So what I need, I need something else. Something else is that I have to find some unknown property of the formula. The property I don't know. How to find which property? So I took a kind of sample possible equation, final equation, and, and asked myself the question, is it possible for such an equation to be a solution? And after spending a half hour discovered, no. Let's try another equation at random of the type that should come out. Nothing. I did 30 times. No solutions. So there what, what a mathematician calls an obstruction to a solution. Yes. And then another 10 minutes, I found the obstruction, very simple. And that meant I got that the possible equation, I didn't know exactly what, but some, some other equation similar to the one written and with only two terms. Mm -hmm. And the exponent between two could be three, four, one. And instead of three, three to the power of one, two, maybe 90 or 100, but still not too many. And then I thought, oh, this is new information. Let's put it in the back side at, at the left and crank the machine once more. And the exponent, instead of four, would go down to three, then to two, and at two, that equation would come out. Otherwise, we will go down to one, but then I know sigma, and the, and the computer could do the rest. Uh, now, I also want to ask you, Freeman, what the story, because your equation looks much simpler. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure. <laughs> Why that particular one? Yeah, well, the, 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 the although you already said you would prefer the diagram, perhaps. Yes, I mean, I, I wish Moritz Escher was here. He, he would, you know, he was a, a Dutch artist. Yes. Who really understood mathematics. He was <laughs> the, by far the best, I think, of the artists who have a deep understanding of mathematics and who put it into his paintings. And, and so you see, he, he had these wonderful paintings of the modular group. The modular group is one of the objects which mathematicians love and cherish. And uh, Escher could actually draw it on the, pa on the, on the paper with angels and devils and, and yes. figures of flying birds. So he, he made it beautiful in a way that nobody else has been able to do. 
And so I wish we, that would be the way to explain to you what the modular group really is. You should see it as a picture. That's, uh, but in any case, I can't do that. All I can do is write down this uh, equation, which is not very informative. The, the, uh, it, what, what is called the, the basic invariant of the modular group is just a function of one variable with coefficients, which Ramanujan got interested in. And Ramanujan was my hero as a schoolboy. And he was a, a mathematical genius who grew up in India around the 1900. And he came to England in 1914 at a very unfortunate moment when World War I was just breaking out. So he was then stranded in England all through the war. And he had only one person really to talk to since all the British mathematicians were away fighting the war and they were all soldiers. So there was only this rather uh, middle-aged professor who happened to be a conscientious subjector whose name was Hardy. And, and so Hardy and Ramanujan worked together for the four years of the war. And uh, th it was a marvelous collaboration, this very, very conventional but, but, but gifted English professor and this totally brilliant but completely unschooled Indian. And then they managed to work together in, a, in an astonishing fashion. And uh, so I, I fell in love with Ramanujan. And, and I, I was, of course, then long afterwards, I came along 20 years later when Ramanujan had died tragically young in 1920. So there is, I just make a quote from Hardy. Hardy wrote a book about Ramanujan, which is, I got hold of as a schoolboy and guided my youthful efforts. And, and uh, so this is what Hardy had to say, that uh, talking about this coefficient tau of n, which I wrote down on the blackboard. The, um, so Hardy says, I shall, I shall devote this lecture to an intensive study of the properties of tau of n, that is that thing there, which are very remarkable and still very imperfectly understood. We may seem to be straying into one of the backwaters of mathematics, which is true. I mean, it is not important mathematics. It's the least important of all the equations that you see on, on, on <laughs> these various pictures. It, it, it's a totally unimportant but beautiful part of mathematics. We, we may be straying into one of the backwaters of mathematics, but the genesis of tau of n as a coefficient in so fundamental a function compels us to treat it with respect. So I treat it with, with respect because it is the sort of the fundamental invariant attached to the modular group. And what was remarkable, uh, uh, Ramanujan discovered a huge number of beautiful properties of this function tau, but he missed this one. And that was, of course, my tremendous luck. <laughs> <laughs> I actually found this equation for tau of n, which Ramanujan missed. And uh, what it reveals, which had, was totally unexpected, was a five-fold symmetry that that thing on the right-hand side of the equation is a sum over five integers, a, b, c, d, and e. And of course, I wasn't allowed to write on the page what the conditions they have to satisfy. A plus B plus B C plus D plus E is equal to zero, and A squared plus B squared plus C squared plus D squared plus E squared is 10 times N. And they all have to belong to different categories when divided by five. That is, A is five, five, five times something plus one, B is five times something plus two, C is five times something plus three, D is five times something plus four, e is five times something plus five. And, and so that actually is what the equation says. That's all understood, so to say. <laughs> anyhow, I wasn't allowed to write that on the picture. But uh, anyhow, this uh, amazing symmetry appears that the whole, that, 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 that a hidden 
five-fold symmetry in that invariant, in which came to me at, at, as a complete surprise. Well, I, 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 the, the rest of the story is that Ian MacDonald is another mathematician who happened to be at the Institute at the same time. So he and I were independently working on the tau function just side by side, only he was supposed to be a mathematician and I was supposed to be a physicist. But we both had daughters at the nursery school and, and or at the, I know it was not, the, it was at the public, at the Princeton public school. And uh, so we talked to each other about our daughters, but not about mathematics. And so it turned out he discovered the equation, the same equation actually a little bit before I did. But luckily he didn't tell me, so I had the pleasure of discovering it independently. <laughs> <laughs> but it is the Donaldson equation. And, and, uh, but now it's by Freeman Dyson. No, he had a much more general class of equations and he understood it more deeply. And there are, there are all sorts of beautiful properties which he understood. Thank you. Dan, just looking at the, uh, these two uh, contributions, but uh, all ten. But one thing I find striking, in some sense, how different the equations are. Clearly, these are different mathematicians do. Yeah. But in some sense, it also looks like the whole concept of beauty in the equations is different. So looking at that, were you surprised with the choices? What, do you see any kind of um, themes or, or, or a diversity that you want to uh, speak about? Yeah, I mean, so both of those things, themes and diversity, I think, uh, I mean, both... Freeman and Enrico mentioned surprise. They, men they, which I actually think it went often when a mathematician says something's beautiful, they were surprised by some connection. Um, they were just surprised and made them happy. Uh, and that's I, to the extent that surprise can be an aesthetic. Uh, I, I think that that is one uh, in mathematics. There's also, I do think our guiding aesthetic as mathematicians is simplicity. Um, that that's. Uh, I think many there, there are there are more mathematicians in this audience than in any other panel that where where I where, where I where I've talked about this uh, this portfolio. Um, you can't bluff your way through. <laughs> so, but right, but um, but uh, I have to say that I mean many people in this room, I'm sure uh, myself uh, included, we've proved something and then we don't stop because the proof isn't right. The you know picture isn't correct and. You try to remove things generally. I think it's 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 rare that you add things to a paper. Uh, in fact, the editor will then tell you to throw them out because it detracts from the argument. Um, so I I think that that is a simplicity and surprise, uh, friendship, which just comes with the emotion. I think that that uh, that uh, both Enrico and um, and Freeman had it was they they have a memory that there's a that there's a heartfelt, honestly, connection to the, to the period in, in which they discovered these things. So that's a, I think that's a general thing. There is a personal aspect to doing so we mathematics. Heard, we heard two kind of fascinating stories, uh, personally very significant. Uh, but would you say all 10 have a story like that attached to it? Well, I'm, uh, so... Do you want to say something about it? I have a quick comment. The, in my opinion, the, the beauty of the formulas we have talked about is not just the formula itself, but the fact that the outcome has a very special meaning. So it's not just a complicated thing becomes simple. That simple reflects something else. Uh, it's uh, what is called simple groups. Uh, and uh, the other one reflects uh, the tau n, which is associated to a very, very fundamental function. Uh, and so that, that's the, the, it's a secret beauty comes at the, at the end. There is something beyond the, the object. I just want to open up the discussion here to the public, I think. And, and this is your moment to ask any question about this kind of grandiose theme. So uh, I think I'll, I have to yeah, steal sure. one of your microphones. Anybody, question? Yes. Hi, Professor Dyson. I thought I met this formula somewhere before, so I just checked online. I thought I read an article by you called The Master Post Opportunities about 40 years ago. And in the beginning of the paper, I think I, uh, 
I have to check it again. So he wrote something like, it is important for him who wants to discover not to confine himself to one chapter of science, but to keep in touch with various others. So this is a quote by uh, Hadam, I think. And what is the biggest opportunity we have missed uh, from other sciences from your viewpoint? Thank you. Yeah, this was a Gibbs lecture I gave in, in to the American Mathematical Society where I was talking about the, uh, this equation in, in particular. And uh, no, the fact is, of course, that I'm a dabbler in many fields. I'm an applied mathematician. I, liked, I never created mathematics. I've always used mathematics to solve problems in other fields, and partly in number theory, which I consider part of applied mathematics, <laughs> and, but also in physics and uh, engineering and other fields. And it is, of course, an amazing thing how well the criterion of beauty has worked, in, especially in physics, that we have looked for th beautiful theories in physics and found so, so many times that theories which were invented just because they're simple and beautiful turns out to be agreeing with nature. And uh, Some of them are actually displayed here, right? Yes. The, the, some models of the standard, the equations of, of the these standard model. Yes. we see there are, in fact, out of physics. Yes. But it uh, doesn't always work. I mean, the, nature's taste in beauty is not always the same as ours. And I remember a, a conversation I had with Dirac here in Princeton, which always has remained with me uh, as, as something I remember vividly. That this was in the year 1948. I was new at the Institute. I was very excited because there was new work that had been done by two American geniuses, Julian Schwinger and Richard Feynman, uh, uh, rejuvenating the theory, the theory of radiation. And this was all new stuff, which was very beautiful, and I was so excited about this. And I happened to meet Dirac here in the, in, in, at the Institute. And Dirac was famous then and still famous today as the most strong believer in beauty, that he was always very much stressed that beauty was the important thing in doing physics. That, uh, and he got all his beautiful discoveries by searching for beauty much more than by looking at experiments. Well then, so I met this Dirac and I was so excited, I said to him, well, Professor Dirac, are you excited about these new discoveries in electrodynamics? And Dirac always said very few words and, and he was silent for quite a while. And then he said, I might have believed that the new results were correct if they had not been so ugly. <laughs> I have a question then. Do you feel that this sense of beauty uh, has been evolving over time? Well, of course. It because probably, uh, the, I, if I can speak on, uh, on behalf of a later generation, we think, many of us think that these equations of that particular theory are incredibly beautiful. Yes, tastes do change. And of course, uh, also, that, uh, I mean, the equations are now much better understood than they were then. And so uh, a lot more has been put in. Uh, after those times, the equations are still the same, but the interpretations are different. So undoubtedly, they, they can be seen as beautiful, but they still, do, they're not as beautiful as they should be. They are, there's a sort of, a, still, a, in my mind at least, they're still rather messy. Question there. Professor Dyson, I'm wondering about the explanation, uh, exp Exclamation points in the that follow the one, two, three, four in your <laughs> equation. The the factorial sign. It's 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 not an exclamation point of beauty, right? <laughs> the question was the uh, the exclamation. Yes, mark, that's simply uh, that's just mathematical jargon. That uh, <laughs> if you if you say. For uh, four exclamation mark means one times two times three times four. So it's just a shorthand for 24. And 
So three with an exclamation mark is shorthand for six, and so it goes. Then, yeah, I, I, you know, that's that's such a great question because I have to say that every, almost to a person, non-mathematicians love that equation because of the exclamation marks. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 they look at it and they say, you know. I like this one, but you know, I, re I like that one. It's very happy. I love those exclamation marks. <laughs> so uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful addition. Einstein could have written equals MC <laughs> two exclamation mark would still be right, actually. <laughs> Another question. Yeah, in the back. Just wait a moment for the microphone. Symmetry when you were uh, describing your processes, and I was just wondering if symmetry is an objective or is something that you said symmetry is in 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 mirrors, uh, but symmetry in nature. I was just wondering how symmetry figured in the equations that you were looking for. Enrico, okay, um, <clears throat> the symmetries I'm considering are essentially obtained by rotations and reflections, nothing else. And they can be combined in an incredible number of, of times uh, by starting with one and then making another one, another one. And um, if you start with a certain number of symmetries and combine them in all possible ways, then you, t you, you obtain a group. And sometimes uh, uh, you can get, uh, so you can get a, what is called a finite group. For example, two reflections in a, in a mirror, and uh, one does nothing. One simple reflection repeat. You get back where you started. So those are the finite groups. So when a, by symmetry is a kind of general idea in which the same object, for example, moves from not necessarily. Uh, say like uh, in, a, in a pentagon from one vertice from next to the next to the next to the next five times, that's a five-fold symmetry. So the combination of this type of symmetries is uh, what uh, the problem is, comes from. What I find actually interesting, if I look at the ten choices being made, actually quite a few, uh, both of you, there is a symmetry. You know, you, we haven't pictured it, so you, you could have an astro diagram, you could have a, perhaps a more complicated picture. But is, yes. is it kind of a, a coincidence that so many of the formulas and equations that are written down have this sometimes very explicit connection with symmetry groups? Perhaps, Freeman, you can say something about it? Yeah, this is a miracle. We just don't <laughs> understand it. And, but <laughs> nature loves symmetry, but in a very sophisticated fashion, because so often the symmetries are broken that, in fact, the theory is symmetrical, but the reality is not. And of course, that's what gives the universe this wonderful structure, so much variety and so much individuality in different parts of the universe, different kinds of creatures, different kinds of objects, because the solutions are not symmetrical, but nevertheless, the underlying equations are. And that's a trick which we have just only just begun to learn, to combine the symmetry of the ideas with the asymmetry of, of the objects that we observe. And you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I, I'm not quite sure what, I mean, maybe eight of those yeah. prints involve some form of symmetry, uh, one or another. Uh, I, arguably, you could say that mathematics for anyone, no matter how abstract, if you trace it to its origins, comes from something in the world. To the extent that there's symmetry in the world that a lot of mathematicians actually then use in their work and sort of inspires them, maybe from even in some unconscious way. I, I think it's not, it's, it's not so surprising to me. Uh, many mathematicians have written about symmetry and aesthetics. Uh, it, in fact, the famous book of, uh, of uh, Herman Weil, um, Symmetry, uh, a lesser known book actually by Garrett Burkhoff, which I think is something like the mathematics of aesthetics or something. Uh, I mean, it's a, and I don't mean this in a pejorative sense, but 
symmetry is probably among the most accessible mathematical ideas, but I think that there's something that there's something deep in the unconscious of many of us that that we appreciate and then in mathematics and in art or anything we then have some way to express that and articulate it. Um. Perhaps one last question. Yes. Just wait for the microphone and we can hear you all. This question is for Freeman and Enrico. How do you understand the difference in criteria for beauty between physics and mathematics? Or is there such a difference? The, the, the difference in what? The criteria for beauty between physics and mathematics. Criteria of beauty, yes. Uh, is there a difference? I would say if, if to, to a very great extent they are the same. I mean, it is, uh, I mean, it, and of course, in, in physics there is a different kind of beauty when you're Standing under a starlit sky on, and, um, on <laughs> admiring the universe, that's of course different from the mathematical beauty. But as soon as you start thinking about how it works, then it's the same. Enrico? Well, for a, for a mathematician, you know, uh, mathematics is not just the collection of all formulas or all possible deductions uh, from a, one formula to another. So, uh, because that, that will be chaos. So, what, what happens is that is the way things are related that make, make sense. So, uh, symmetry, for example, is such a simple fundamental concept that guides uh, a lot of mathematics. Um, and I think m physics also, the mathematics comes into physics, uh, tries to look at the very roots of physics. And so the mathematician tries to look at the very roots of, of mathematics and not, not at the overall, overall object. So the the those basic roots and some we're not discovered all of them, but they're still discovering them, and those are the beautiful parts of mathematics. Dan, I want to ask you. Uh, you know, you've done this project. You know, it's wonderful to have this exhibition here and have you here. Uh, you said you have been already. You know, this these prints are displayed elsewhere, so you are getting some experience in the discussions around the prints, etc. So, uh, what have you learned uh, from this project? Um, uh, also, as a as a scholar, as a mathematician, um, about what how people perceive these issues. What, what what did you learn about mathematics? What did I? Hmm, I I mean, I've I've learned a lot. I'm not I'm not sure I've learned anything about mathematics, to be honest. I I have learned a bit about how people see mathematics. Um, I the the first place where they were shown in some kind of event was at the Yale Art Gallery, um, and uh, the uh, I was talking to the to the curator um, of the show there, and we were and you know and she was saying how I mean when when she sees these things, I mean she just sees the print. And I and I joke with her, and I said, "Well, you know, you you can't read them, and I can't not read them." Um, and it, I, I mean, I have to say that it's. I mean, to me, my, to be honest, is my first attraction to mathematics was totally visual in the, of this kind. My father was a physicist uh, just down the road at Rutgers, and I would love to go to his office and see the blackboards. I didn't understand a single thing on them, but I just liked to see the blackboards. They were, they were so pretty to me. And I, as I say in my little essay, I just, you know, I, I wanted to one day make those little pictures. Um, and, uh, and then ironically, the way in which I actually got interested in art was through the words about art. It wasn't actually in the pictures. Mm -hmm. I was sort of more interested in the philosophy behind why certain movements uh, came about. And when I understood that better, I actually liked the art more. Um, so I think the, the most interesting for, thing for me about this project is to see how people in the arts who know something about art and the production of prints uh, receive these. Uh, 
for what it's worth, these are actually quite complicated executions as prints, and I'm, I'm not a printmaker, so I'm sort of recapitulating what Bob Feldman would tell me or what Harlan and Weaver would tell me, which is that uh, it's very hard to make an aquatint, which is off a copper plate and then you know pressed at some unbelievably uh, hard uh, pressure, um, an, an inked plate on the paper. Um, it's very, very difficult to get an aquatint like that that's so deeply black where the lines are so sharply white. Um, to actually have a piece of paper hold that kind of definition and clarity is a very, it, it's a great technical accomplishment that was accomplished by Harlan and Weaver on the Lower East Side. Um, and uh, so when the printmaker, as I, uh, when, the, when, the, when the art historian, the curator sees these, they're seeing the complexity of that process. Um, they're also seeing the history of, I mean, where do, you know, whether it's minimalism, whether it's calligraphy, um, I mean, all sorts of different aspects. You could draw a lot of different analogies, and we don't have time, but for the various things that people have, have picked for these. So what, what the knowledgeable art historian tells me, I'm always, I, I, I love, and I, and, I, and I love what I've learned, and then, you know, of course, mathematics isn't neutral, right? Somebody, everybody approaches it with some kind of baggage. You're a mathematician, you actually have a favorite formula, for gosh, you know, for God's sakes. If you're, again, the person on the street, you have many a least favorite formula. <laughs> um, and, uh, but even for many of these curators who will all tell me instantly, I never liked math, I hated math, they like the visual aspect of it, which, Again, I go back to my beginnings. I can completely appreciate, but I took a, I decided to try to construct them, and they decided to make prints generally. So, thanks. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm keenly aware of the gigantic blackboard behind <laughs> us, <laughs> and you're controlling the urge to write down an equation there. I think, uh, but uh, thank you so much uh, for doing this, for being here, Enrico Freeman, for being a contributor artist and sharing some of the. Uh, uh, background between the equations. I think one thing that definitely came across, you know, uh, how amazingly much can be concentrated in an image which has so many different connotations. And I'm particularly happy to have these prints here, and thanks through your largesse, Enrico, uh, because I think these, this is also a lot of meaning for the Institute, actually, in these prints. And so, delight to have you all here and share this uh, conversation with you all. And I think this is the end of the formal part of the program. And the, the one take home message I have, if in any equation I will use exclamation marks now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>